to me, we have um, Anthony Hattinger, uh, who is the co-founder and CEO um, of Detroit Into, which is one of the businesses and startups that we've been referring to as really strengthening the economic vitality of, of our city. Next to Anthony is Kathy Belk, who is president of Jumpstart in Cleveland, um, an organization that really helps entrepreneurs hit their stride in supporting Cleveland's economic vitality and communities. Um, we're honored to have Pam Lewis of the New Economy Initiative, um, which Rip mentioned has been one of the driving um, forces between um, the economic vitality um, in Detroit today. And then lastly, Kathy, not lastly, <laughs> not, well, okay. <laughs> Last but Two not over. least, uh, we have Janice Bowdler, um, who is with us from J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, she is a managing director who focuses um, not only on small business, but also community development. And I think uh, one of the things you'll hear us talk about is actually the linkage between economic development and community development in our cities. Um, so I actually wanted to start with Janice um, because J.P. Morgan Chase has made such a large uh, investment in small business. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks would be um, somewhat skeptical of that. They'd say, no, we need big business to drive um, our economies at scale. So I wondered if you could help us understand why really small business is important in our cities and what role it plays uniquely that big business may not. Absolutely. And uh, let me start, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you all for uh, turning out this morning. It's great to be with you. Um, we actually doubled down on our commitment to small businesses. Uh, small Business Forward started as a $30 million initiative. We hit that goal three years early uh, and last year announced $75 million over the next three years. Um, that's in addition to what we're investing in the city of Detroit. We just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago that we hit our $100 million commitment two years early, um, and we think we'll get to $150 million in the city, um, which is across a number of different areas, let me be clear, not just small business. Um, but in, on both of these tracks, we see uh, a lot of potential there. Um, let me give you three reasons why I think small businesses are incredibly important for local economies. Um, first, we know that they're creating the largest uh, share of new jobs in cities. Now, they, there's some challenges there, and we'll talk about that later, but uh, we're all here because we know that they're big um, job creators. Um, but just as importantly as the jobs that they are creating is who they're creating jobs for. And that's something we've been focusing a lot on our work in Detroit and other cities. Um, Minority-owned small businesses are more likely to hire um, minority individuals. That's great. We did a research project with the Initiative for a Competitive Inner City. There, that paper is around here somewhere. Uh, you can pick up a copy. And one of the things that we found is that small business owners are also more likely to hire from distressed inner cities. And this was especially true in Detroit, where 64% of inner city jobs were coming from small business employers. And the third reason is this community revitalization point. Um, let me reference some research from the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute, which found that Detroiters were more likely um, sort of over-indexed in their amount of spend on small businesses. But low-income Detroiters, as in low-income uh, individuals in a lot of cities, had to actually travel much farther. They have to travel outside of their neighborhood to get common goods and services that people with means and people who have a lot of choices in their neighborhoods that are moving to urban areas, they're opting for places where it's walkable. That's why they're choosing those urban areas. Now, the traditional community development perspective was um, the retail follows uh, the income, right? So you have high income residents. Of course, you have a lot of retail that surrounds them. What I think is fascinating about Detroit is it's giving us an opportunity to really flip this narrative on its head. If you look at what's happened in West Village, where the, the revitalization of that neighborhood really started with retail and said, no, in fact, we need good retail, interesting small businesses here in order to drive uh, increased density around residential to attract new residents into this neighborhood, as well as meet the needs of the residents that live there. Um, that's, a, that's a new way for us to think about community development strategy, and Detroit is really uh, at the forefront of that effort. So interesting. I, I think another thing that's been um, 
uh, very interesting on top of that is the way that the city has gone about cultivating those small businesses and the role of nonprofit organizations in supporting that. And so like picking up on that theme, um, Pam, could you speak about what it is NEI has contributed and how you're supporting entrepreneurs and making those things that Janice just mentioned in sure. West Village happen? Happy to. Uh, good morning. So New Economy Initiative, as Rip mentioned, a collaborative of foundations that launched 10 years ago Really, it's important to understand kind of the beginnings of NEI to really appreciate the role it's played in small business. But when you think about how entrepreneurship was traditionally supported in states, it was always focused around high tech. It was always focused around what was happening in eds and meds and you know, the smartest researchers in the world. Let's get all the support around them so that they can create new industries and jobs. <clears throat> but what's been powerful about the role of philanthropy in this space is that we, ha we didn't have to pick high tech, we didn't have to focus on a statewide. We could have a place-based play, and we could also say, you know what, the value of an entrepreneur that's opening up a coffee shop is just as important as the value of an entrepreneur that's opening up, you know, commercializing a technology that will bring the next cure for cancer. And so we've been um, making investments in incubators, <coughs> accelerators, procurement programs, small business challenges, microloan programs to help uh, support business owners in the city of Detroit and the cities of Hamtramck and Highland Park. These are cities with high poverty level and a lot of job loss. And the whole point is jobs in Detroit is not necessarily equivalent to jobs for Detroiters in Detroit. And a lot of the small business <laughs> development is focused around that. Mm -hmm. And so we've moved probably $104 million in grants. Um, Kresge was one of our lead funders along with Kellogg and Ford and others. Uh, and about 30 million of that has been focused within the city of Detroit around small business. We also believe that you know it's not an or strategy, it's an and strategy. So small business and high tech and high growth are important for, for us. Um, but with our small business development, again, in that space, we see you know 60% of those businesses being owned by women. Mm -hmm. uh, we see 65 or so percent of them being owned by people of color. And they're creating jobs in high poverty zip codes that are allowing people that work, live in that zip code to actually work in that zip code. That's been one of the big tensions in our work as we work at Kresge, kind of looking at you know, regional jobs versus jobs in a city and employing mm -hmm. people in a region versus employing people in a city and the difference that you really can drive in action when you have that laser focus. Um, so, so we talked quite a bit about Detroit. Um, and it's interesting because it shares a lot of, I believe, similar challenges with what you're facing in Cleveland. But your approach to actually providing support to entrepreneurs has been somewhat different in terms of the sectors that are involved. Mm -hmm. So Kathy, could you share with us a bit about the, the differences you see in the cities and also maybe how having so many sectors at the table has made a difference? Mm -hmm. Sure, so hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Kathy Belk. I work with Jumpstart, which is headquartered in Cleveland, and, and our primary work is in Ohio. And it's, it's a great pleasure to be on the panel today with folks from Detroit because one of the many benefits of working at a nonprofit in this space is that you model yourself and learn things from other cities, and Detroit has certainly been one that we've spent some time looking at and paying attention to, as well as a number of other cities across the country. So thanks for including us. Um, Jumpstart, the organization with which I work, is uh, a 12-year-old nonprofit, our mission today is to unlock the full potential of diverse and ambitious entrepreneurs to economically transform entire communities. When we first started, we were very focused on high-tech entrepreneurs. It's exactly what Pam was mentioning. Uh, but together with our partners, we identified that we needed to create a broader set of jobs and a broader set of opportunities in our community. And we now today, with partners, always in collaboration with others, support not only um, high-tech entrepreneurs, but also small businesses and micro-enterprises, as well as scaling businesses, existing businesses that can create disproportionately high numbers of jobs by scaling more quickly. So in doing that, um, we have modeled a lot of things that have a lot of commonalities with Detroit, certainly um, in the nonprofit ecosystem. One of the many benefits that, or the, the commonalities is that we all work together in um, partnership with our philanthropic leaders, our civic leaders, and certainly our, um, our public sector leaders have played a big role in the work that is occurring in 
uh, Cleveland and in Northeast Ohio more broadly. So we've had the same benefits from that of great, of great thinking. Um, we have had a number of initiatives in addition to small business focus, which is really what, what we do, which have been focused on some sectors. So biomedical has been a big sector of focus for us, as has been manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. And one of the um, benefits that we have found is that in supporting our small businesses and entrepreneurs as we do, having additional support organizations very focused on sectors has enabled us to access really critical technical skills and bring those technical skills to the table with the entrepreneurs that we're working with. They are also working on cluster building initiatives and of course uh, attraction strategies. So it's a, it's a nice set of partners who are looking at the economy and, and wanting us to grow in a very diversified way and not placing maybe all our bets on entrepreneurship. But of course we think and I think that uh, our entrepreneurs are, have been, played a critical role in the continued uh, economic vitality of Cleveland. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, I think, um, working with Pam and, and hearing you speak, that, that layer beneath cluster and industry, but thinking through big, small, who, what, um, it seems to really, really kind of hone in on the work. Um, so I, we talked, I think we've talked somewhat convincingly around why small business is different and what it can drive um, in community. But we have been speaking about folks who run businesses and we have one of them here. <laughs> um, so I, I did wanna kind of, so we've been talking a lot about what we think an organization like yours brings to the community, and I'm just wondering if you could share, what is it you, you see Detroit Into as, as really adding and contributing to Detroit's economy and also its, its comeback? Yeah, uh, good morning. My name is Anthony Hadinger, and I'm a partner in Detroit Ento. We are a farm and manufacturing firm that uses insects as a vehicle for human food, pharmaceuticals, and livestock feed. And so in our journey, we've kind of been looking at how do we create this new platform that allows us to play on what entrepreneurship is bringing to the city, while also creating something that's completely necessary in the marketplace, which is you know, environmentally friendly proteins that are also able to modularly scale. And so to kind of give you the quick run through of uh, our history, we started in late summer of 2015. Um, I come from a background of horticulture and religion from Michigan State. I was working at a nonprofit called Central Detroit Christian where I ran all of their community gardens and an aquaponics farm where we did indoor tilapia production using the fish effluents as uh, feed for the herbs and so on and so forth. In that process, we found that uh, the highest cost of the operation was fish feed and fish feed coming from a market that is tanking, the fish meal market, Insects could be a viable uh, vehicle for that, as well as things like chicken feed or things like uh, fiber pills, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at this from a different perspective of change. Um, where we are now is that because this is in an industry that's completely unregulated, federally down, it's on a state-by-state -state basis on how these businesses can operate, which obviously puts um, a lot of structure around how we can receive funding mm -hmm. um, and how do we grow. But we believe that we have to move from a place of scalable efficiency economies to scalable learning economies. And what this really means is that we have to be able to look at where the needs are in the landscape. We know that you know, facing climate change and mm -hmm. some of the other issues, particularly dealing with food access and distribution of food, mm -hmm. um, are, very, are very critical to the future of how we develop as a people. So what we aim to do is have the entire supply chain in Detroit. So that means production. We are starting with crickets. Uh, mm -hmm. Crickets are kind of um, you know, the a friendliest version that people can get behind. There's been a lot of traction. <laughs> there's been a lot of traction in the sector from um, things like Shark Tank. Yeah. So there's been two insect companies that have already been invested in on that show, for instance. Um, and then moving into other things like um, fly larva that can be used for wastewater treatment, mm -hmm. for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So production, processing, manufacturing, and distribution can all be done in the city. We know that through adaptive land reuse, we can turn dilapidated structures into these factories. Um, and we also know that we can create a new type of job skills training through ag tech development. And so where we are currently, we've um, had to do this, like I said, regulatory dance, which is okay. We have to be, we're okay with being a guinea pig knowing that this is creating global change. Um, in that, we found some niches, especially in the culinary mm -hmm. sector, 
So most recently, we did a pop-up dinner with Magna, which is an automotive supplier, served over 1,000 auto executives and designers insect food. Um, and now we're currently working with Detroit Public Schools to do a, um, a deep dive in food manufacturing and product development as a way to use that as a learning platform to create um, eventually some job skills. So we know that broader term, once this can pick up in scale, it can have a wide range of effects on how it uplifts people. Mm -hmm. Because in this panel, especially as you know, you know, a minority business owner, um, we have to look at this in a way that is bringing everybody to the table um, that isn't necessarily currently there. And that involves investing in ideas and investing in infrastructures and investing in people. It's, it's such a, um, I think, you know, we, we see often it's so hard for, for cities who have heritage industries who uh, focus in certain areas to really think about the future and wh where the next set of jobs are going to come from. So one of the things, you know, we feel, find so inspiring about your business is it really is thinking on, like, where is the economy going to go and how do we make sure Detroit is there um, before other players. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I, we, you know, this, We've had, Pam has had some success, Kathy, you've had success, Janice. We, I mean, it's exciting to see this, it's palpable. But at the same time, we're still not there yet. You know, I mean, you just explained how you sort of had to jump through some loopholes to figure out the funding and the regulations. I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the uglier side of this, like what we haven't yet done and what we need to do next. Um, so this is a question, I mean, to all of you in a way. Um, we heard from our, um, the entrepreneurs that we polled that it was necessary for them to have um, a skilled workforce that actually you know, aligned with their open jobs, and at the same time that they needed more customers with spending power. Um, could, you, could you speak, um, uh, Kathy and Pam, a little bit about what it is you've learned that, that we're not doing yet that we need to do next in, in our cities? Well, I don't want to talk about that yet. Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> No, well, yeah, I, I do want to get there, but I think it's important to, I want to thread something together first before we go there, because Anthony, to me, embodies the spirit of a Detroit entrepreneur. And, and you would think that, you know, someone like him is going to start and thrive in a business anyway, but how has the entrepreneurial ecosystem helped to support a person like Anthony? You know, and, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, he attended the Build Institute, which is an entrepreneurial program mm -hmm. that's right in the neighborhood. He's... Um, had support from Food Lab, another philanthropically supported initiative, and then looking at space in Tech Town, which is another philanthropically supported organization. And I think it's important to understand how, you know, the infrastructure that you mentioned, Rip, how that supports an individual like Anthony. Mm -hmm. You know, we're having conversations around what challenges he can apply to uh, because of the free capital that's happening for business owners around that space. So with that being said, um, there are challenges. What we've found uh, for a lot, of, a lot of companies, particularly like ones like Anthony and those that have maybe uh, scaled a little faster, when it comes to getting them to start and feel supported in Detroit is one thing. Having them to be able to grow and stick and scale and find affordable spaces so that they land and anchor in Detroit mm -hmm. is a little bit of a challenge. Mm. And, and what's the role that we can play to help provide, you know, right now you have, you know, two cents a square foot at some places versus a million dollars a square foot at others. Mm -hmm. And finding that middle ground where it's flexible and affordable so that as Anthony's company, company grows, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it can actually grow within the city. I think another challenge has been how capital is moved to minorities and women um, we're very proud of the fact that a lot of the, the companies that are being supported by the, by the organizations that are supporting entrepreneurs are seeing, you know, large percentages of women and minorities coming through the doors and getting support. Um, but when you track the capital, mm -hmm. uh, that's still a challenge where you're not necessarily seeing the dollars, uh, particularly on the early stage seed side, more so on the microloan side, but when you talk about high growth businesses, mm -hmm. You're not seeing those dollars move. And so we're really working hard to figure out what are some interventions to make that difference. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the role of those high growth businesses are so important because we feel like those types of businesses growing in Detroit will become jobs that are more relevant to Detroiters. Mm -hmm. um, it's a city with, you know, um, 
12% of the population have college degree, four-year college degrees. Um, it's a city that, you know, has poverty at 40%, and if you factor in how it costs to live, you're going to get another percentage of people that actually have trouble just maintaining. They, they aren't in poverty, mm -hmm. but they still have trouble maintaining work. So getting those people quality jobs. That's why it's important that when McClure Pickles gets support from the entrepreneurial ecosystem, that they grow and they employ Detroiters with high quality jobs. Um, so those are some of the challenges that I see. It's more around the space and the capital. Yeah. Um, but I do agree regarding the workforce that is important. But where our mind is a lot of times is around, you know, how can we continue to help the companies that can employ Detroiters stay in Detroit and then get the capital they need to scale. Yes, so I'm so glad that you uh, mentioned some of those themes. Those are similar. I want to maybe touch on a couple of them. Um, from a capital perspective, you know, I think unless you're living on the coast, there's always a capital challenge for, for growing businesses uh, in the middle of the country. And certainly that's been a big focus of the work that our community has been um, uh, trying to build, which is the whole continuum of uh, sources of capital for entrepreneurs and for small businesses, so both on the investing side and on the lending side. Uh, and in particular, the point we also noticed about the lack of female and minority entrepreneurs' participation, particularly on the investing side, is a national trend. Uh, one of the things that we did recently was launch a $10 million fund to invest only in minority and women-owned uh, tech entrepreneur businesses so that we can just ensure that we are addressing that gap and having funds that we go into those companies. So um, the, the capital gap is something we're going to continue to work on. Now we see that you know the next stage up, maybe the half a million dollars to $2 million continues to be a gap as companies are growing. And we don't want people to, to walk out on a plank and fall into the ocean. We want to create that, that capital system. So that's something that um, we're going to continue to work on. The other thing that we noticed that is very similar to some of the things you mentioned is um, we had not had as much particip participation in our work, and when I say our, like the collective work of our, and our partners, of people who are living in particular neighborhoods in our cities. We wanted to have more people who lived in the neighborhoods who had entrepreneurial potential or had ideas to be connected to our ecosystem, and we just didn't have the connections there. And I think that's a, an area we've been working hard on with some programmatic work, but I think in general, we want to go much deeper in terms of connecting economic development activities <laughs> for small businesses and neighborhood or community development activities for things like building the spaces that those kinds of entrepreneurs need and then supporting the growth of the kinds of businesses who can fill those spaces from people who live in that neighborhood and will create jobs for the people in that neighborhood. So that's the next thing that we're really working on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because I think what all three of you described is almost a system in the city mm -hmm. that supports individuals on their quest to growing their businesses. And um, I'm curious, you know, as we think about this, this capital gap, right, more capital needing to be made available, like Janice, as a, um, as, a, as a funder, how do you think about, is that system strong in every city in the United States right now? You know, where are, are you seeing a lot of gaps there? What's the infrastructure soft infrastructure cities still need to, to, to be to invested in in this way? Uh, well, the really short answer is no. Yeah. Um, the, the system isn't there. Um, but, uh, but let me take a step back and, and work up to that. Um, because we, you know, I started by talking about the fact that um, small businesses are creating the greatest share of new jobs. They're also a place where we lose a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be careful and make sure we're doing this problem diagnosis well because there's, um, I think there's a, a pendulum here that could swing too far one way or the other. Either we're not focusing on small businesses at all, or we think mm -hmm. small businesses are the silver mm -hmm. bullet. Mm -hmm. And without creating these kinds of ecosystems that are necessary to really support and drive our growth in small businesses. Our research shows that cash volatility, employment volatility, I mean, getting really specific on some of the challenges that our entrepreneurs are facing is really critical. And so one of the first things that I think cities need to do, and it gets to the capital issue, is just some basic segmentation of who are the businesses mm. um, in their city, how are they lining up against the growth industries, and how are they lining up against the neighborhoods. 
Detroit is really is doing this, um, and I think what you're hearing from from both of, um, from Kathy and from Pamela that we don't see in every city is first of all this both and of high growth and our neighborhood based businesses. I will tell you, plenty of times we walk into cities and what we hear are a lot of economic development departments that are more concerned about landing the next big fish and their small businesses are sort of in the community affairs department somewhere. They're not thinking about how you really build an ecosystem that's going to support and grow. And again, uh, it's easy to look and say, well, you know, some of these guys are hiring in twos, threes, and fours, but who are they hiring and where are they hiring? And in fact, we think they're hiring a lot of folks for whom this is their first rung on the ladder. It's going to get them into the employment system. Um, or who face a number of, of barriers. So um, cities can start with segmentation. Um, that's going to lead to the capital question because we talk about this monolithically, and we hear entrepreneurs say this all the time. Capital is my biggest problem. Mm, capital might not be your biggest problem, and you guys are on the front lines of this, so I will let you share um, your war stories of people coming in and saying, I need a loan, I need equity, and you're like, actually, let's start from the basics. You might need a bunch of other things before you're even ready for that kind of, um, of investment. But understanding who your businesses are will also tell you what kind of capital you need and be able to better identify those gaps. And I think you're hearing that from, from both what um, Kathy and Pamela are doing. Let me give you... Um, just a third thing quickly that I think um, are really simple for cities to do, but not happening in a lot of places. And you heard a little bit of this from Anthony and Chantelle, he touched on it, which is just c cut the red tape and invest in the infrastructure. <laughs> it sounds really easy, but actually it's not happening. Um, and again, uh, you guys know from being on the front lines, you hear story after story of entrepreneurs who, who quite frankly do not have time to spend all day down at City Hall figuring out the fourth permit to become a, you know, the mm -hmm. licensed contractor that can bid on the big infrastructure project. And if we keep putting those kinds of roadblocks in front of them, it'll be really difficult to, um, to kind of really see some businesses that have the potential to scale to grow. Let me just quickly give you two examples in addition to the ones that are here on the panel of where we see this happening. Um, one is the um, Chicago Case Initiative. Um, which has um, great um, city support, but is really led by the anchor institutions within, um, within the city, the eds and meds, if you will. Um, but getting together and saying like, okay, if you're good enough to do IT at Northwestern, you're probably good enough to do IT at the University of Chicago as well. If you're working in one hospital, you're probably good enough to work in the other hospital. Can they amongst themselves from a business leadership standpoint kind of streamline some of the certification and access points. Um, those kinds of things are, are really helpful. And finally, I would mention, um, you know, again, Detroit's doing a lot of this already, but we, uh, we just launched a pilot in a couple of other cities in partnership with the University of Washington to streamline services for neighborhood-based businesses. And I know I'm going long, but if you will indulge me for one second, because this is a big bugaboo of mine. <laughs> if, you are, if you are a high growth business, there, there are tons of incubators and accelerators out there for you. Everybody loves sexy startups. And you know, if they get less money if they're in the middle of the country, but you know what, everybody loves their, their startups. You have that. If you are a laundromat, if you're a dry cleaner, if you're a restaurateur, if you're a retailer, if you're somewhere down on the supply chain, that kind of wraparound service to help you scale your business mm -hmm. probably doesn't exist. That's what you see this ecosystem in Cleveland and Detroit doing, is replicating what you know, the you know, sort of young people in hoodies walking into an incubator accelerator, that you you walk in there and all those services are brought together in one place for you. But that doesn't exist if you're a neighborhood based business. That's the kind of ecosystem that cities need to replicate. And and one of the things um, so so if it's if it's not if you can't leave startup development and entrepreneurship mm -hmm. development to, you know, Mm -hmm. a couple people working mm -hmm. in a certain way. You have to really professionalize and push on this and have a system. Mm -hmm. I guess, like, what, how, how did, how did Detroit, how did Cleveland, how did, how, how did you actually, what leadership did it require to actually put these ecosystems in place? Like, if I'm a city today 
and I'm in a city and I, I'm like, oh, I don't have this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I actually like get folks to think about for, forming one of these, these, these ecologies? I mean, can, can you help us on that? And, and Anthony, like, if you are an entrepreneur, you know, how do you actually like access this stuff? I mean, is it, do, how, do you, how do you support people in really finding these things? Because I know you're busy, right, mm -hmm. running your business. And so can we live there for, for a minute? Like, what's the role of leadership in, in businesses and in, in cities to get this stuff? working? Yeah, um, I'll start. I think that where we kind of exist is a space where everything's new. And um, not that what we're doing is new, but how it's being done is new. And in that, we know we have to be able to look at our peers, especially in my sector, kind of transitioning from an urban agricultural space to more of an ag tech space. We know that leadership is kind of you know, from within and brought up by the peer group that surrounds us. So in, in our particular case, being that Detroit is a large uh, urban ag city, folks like Keep Growing Detroit, um, as well as a number of smaller stakeholders, even friends of mine that run small gardens and operations, um, like Neighborhood Bug, my friend Orlando, for instance, mm -hmm. he is able to teach me things. I'm not from Detroit, you know. I have to look at this about how am I trying to support people by learning from people and viewing them as equals, mm -hmm. knowing that they have the you know, same capacity for creation and the same capacity for development um, as someone who's trying to come at it from you know, an academic perspective. And so I believe that at least looking at that, you know, our industry is what we call entomoculture or the edible insect industry, it's very small. Mm -hmm. um, globally, you know, only a few thousand companies exist in this space. And we're all kind of going at this yeah. however we can, because we know there's legislative issues, we know yeah. there's capital issues, we know there's acceptance issues. Um, and on top of that, we're dealing with a system that is quite frankly collapsing, um, talking about our conventional and um, industrial ag system. And these are things that have to be addressed. Uh, we don't really have much time. Mm -hmm. And so in that, we try to find people that are <laughs> that have that have that spark and they're like, let's do this, mm -hmm. you know. On the other end, looking at more of a structural and, um, I guess, entrepreneurial, you know, seedbed, mm -hmm. we've been very fortunate. There's a lot of folks that are here that believe in our idea and want us to succeed. But as, as all the panelists have mentioned, there's a huge gap in disparity on where that leadership kind of lies. Mm -hmm. You can get wraparound services. You can get in-kind lawyer time. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but that doesn't get you necessarily to the right type of mentorship, mm -hmm. or it doesn't get you to the right type of place where you can really foster, mm -hmm. you know, uh, tacit learning. How do you? How can we quickly come across some of these other barriers so that we can get the work done? Um, and that's what we're trying to solve now. We know that we don't. I mean, we have very few answers, <laughs> you know, but we're learning in the yeah. process. And so I think that that's the, what's most important. Working in that place of learning. Right. Is, it's That's where the leadership has yeah. to come from, because. Uh, um, you want me? Can you? Uh, in our experience, so what I love um, about the history that we had around <laughs> taking that first step and then the second step and third step is it's very similar to what you mentioned. So Janice, thank you for mentioning the idea of a scan. Um, that's where Cleveland started, you know, getting a good sense of the landscape, what were the economic drivers and or lack thereof in the greater community, and thank goodness for the philanthropic, private sector, and um, public sector coming together as a collaboration to, rev to think about that scan and to think about what were going to be the major strategies that we would collaborate on and focus on in order to move the city forward. And there were a number of major initiatives that came out of that. So I think that process worked really well in terms of aligning everybody and focusing what are scarce resources against some of the most critical things. That happened in our community 12 plus years ago. And then one of the great things that came of it was a philanthropic fund of funds which emerged to help champion some of those initiatives. It's called the Fund for Economic Future, and it's been a, a really helpful ongoing um, strategy leader in our community for some of the work that came out of that initial scan and prioritization. Uh, but something else that's also interesting that's come up is now there are more entrepreneurs 
and I don't mean entrepreneurs as uh, leaders of companies, I mean more people who are really interested in this topic who have emerged um, from other groups. Maybe it's the YP group or it's other leaders who are emerging in the city who are saying these kinds of issues are important to us and we're going to get together and we're going to figure out how we can also participate in the leadership around initiatives of this. Um, that will help but, our city to grow. But Kathy, like, I'm a tactician, right? Yes. So I'm like, okay, you did a scan. You got to fund together. Who the heck drove this? Like, like, was there an individual? Was it an organization? Like, how? Yeah, so the, um, the, the public-private philanthropic group of people who came together and reviewed the scan essentially had the financial and intellectual capital to seed a number of different leaders. Oh, okay. And those leaders then drove initiatives across the city for several years informed by this organization, the Fund for Economic Future, and others who were helping to, to evolve the thinking and to provide the direction to the leaders. So thank you. That's, that's more helpful and tactical. Um, and that's why it's been easy then for young, younger people, this is largely younger people who've of late been interested to participate in the discussions. They know who to go meet with. You know, they can group together and they can reach out and meet with the folks who are thinking through these issues and say, I've got a new idea or we're interested in focusing in a different part of economic or community development or we have an idea for a great competition, something really tactical. You know, what does it take to move it forward? And so that's been a way that the, the work's been more organic of late. And, and Pam, Detroit yeah. is like always... I, I'm biased, but I find it very <laughs> fascinating in terms of how things come together. And, well, yeah, and, and I happen. don't know if we have time for the full story, yeah. but I mean, Rip touched on it, you know, 10 years ago, which was actually before the Great Recession hit, you know, the, the vision of the foundation leaders in the community to put together this $100 million fund. I think what was unique about it is they put together an organization, New Economy Initiative, that's really a project that sits within the Community Foundation that can deliver and so, sort of serve as a process manager mm -hmm. of an entrepreneurial ecosystem. You look at Denver or Silicon Valley, a lot of entrepreneurial ecosystems are driven by entrepreneurs and the private sector, right? Mm -hmm. um, for us, it's really the, the, the looking at it as an ecosystem was driven by philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And we had the privilege, because philanthropy doesn't usually play in the economic development space in this way, usually it was left to the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, but because inclusion was such a key factor in what we wanted to do, mm -hmm. uh, we had this room to explore and play, and we weren't just grant makers. Yeah. We were also we've also been conveners, where we make a grant to an organization, but we make sure that that organization understands what role they play in the ecosystem so that they can see themselves as a part of an ecosystem mm -hmm. and how that impacts another organization, and then we pull them together so they can talk and get to know each other. You'd assume they knew each other, but they didn't. And so we use our grant dollars to influence relationships, mm -hmm. right? Um, we also did a lot of work of how we track data so that people could see the work as a process, as an ecosystem, and not just independent organizations doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we could socialize and evangelize the notion of inclusion and not just who you serve, but who are you hiring um, and have those conversations across the board. Mm -hmm. And then we could catalyze things. You know, one of the any ideas is a small business plan competition that NEI now stepped out of their role as grant maker and stepped out of their role as convener and actually became a program developer. And this is a program that really celebrates what we call the bin ups. Mm -hmm. You know, those mm -hmm. companies that mm -hmm. you say aren't as sexy as the startups, mm -hmm. where we are giving like a half million dollars a year to 30 or so companies within the city of Detroit, Hamtramck, and Highland Park. And it's not really about the low, and it's 400, 400 words to apply, very low entry uh, to, to, to the capital, but it's not really the capital. It's now all of those 1,800 applicants are in our system. We know who they are. We know what they need. We're just talking to them now, and we're helping them to connect to the mm -hmm. small business support ecosystem that was layered on and developed through philanthropic support through NEI funding. And so, you know, those are the creative ways that we've been using, you know, this, this structure like NEI that's not a foundation and it's yeah. not a, an NGO delivering service to be that process manager of sorts yeah. um, within the city. Yeah, it's so, it's so funny. It's some of the kind of unsexy stuff, you know, like the collaboration, who does the scan, what kinds of capital that it seems like really drives this stuff. Um, I, so, so, look, I... Um, I'm a convert to this, to this, but I, I, 
I do have one kind of nagging question in my head, which is that um, it is, in theory, a beautiful idea that small business and entrepreneurs can do something big business can't do. They can employ people in neighborhoods, um, that they can serve customers in neighborhoods and help revitalize communities. And I, I'm just wondering, is it realistic to think that the people who live in our legacy in Rust Belt cities often who've been disadvantaged in terms of educational attainment, in terms of skill sets, are going to be employed, I mean, by small businesses? Like, what needs to happen for more of the more Detroiters um, to, to have to benefit from these jobs that are being created? I mean, you, you, you mentioned you, you actually work on skills development. C like, could you tell us a little bit about what that looks like? How do you, how do you really connect these jobs to the everyday person in the neighborhood? Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a work in progress, of course, yeah. you know. We, um, we are a very small team, and we have no employees yet. And so what we're trying to do on the back end is how do we develop this framework? How do we put together the skill sets necessary that are easy enough to pick up where that certain qualities are innate to people? And we learned this a lot in gardening in the sense that in some of my work in the past in college, if a child or a group of children grow vegetables with you, and you teach them the process, they're much more likely to eat them, right, for instance. So we know it's an each one teach one system where at this stage, we have to meet people where they're at. Um, and if you get over the bias and the disgust, from that point on, it's, um, <laughs> it's more about what can we create together. So yeah. with our program currently, we're looking at a STEM group um, called Flying Classroom that does these deep dives, experiential learning with students. And so we're starting with a pilot. It's very light. We're doing. Um, month intensive with some culinary students that are part of a technical training center, uh, Davis School and mm -hmm. Bright Hop School. And so we're taking them from the ground up. Why does this matter? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we need to create new food systems? Mm -hmm. um, what is your role in this as someone getting into culinary, as the future mm -hmm. of food insects are going mm -hmm. to be? And then from there, we kind of build. Like, these are your skill sets. You're already cooking. You're already learning. This is just another food. It's about culture. And so we're mm -hmm. trying to make it not a third world food, not mm -hmm. a poverty food, mm -hmm. but an empowerment food, mm -hmm. right? And so if we can work on it from that basis of being able to say, look at you can make something, it's yeah. nutritious, and, it's, um, and it has a, lot of, you know, yeah. um, has a lot of importance to the system, from mm -hmm. there we'll be able to take those skills and turn them into like, okay, this is how you run batch manufacturing. Mm -hmm. This is how you run specialty processing. This is how you create your own food product in a consumer-facing good in a vast, you know, mm -hmm. vastly growing sector. And we know that it has to be building blocks based on where we are also. Is that expensive? Like, how, how does that been your business model? Yes, because it sounds so mm -hmm. it is expensive. It's a very small market. Um, so for us, our cricket powder is $40 a pound, mm -hmm. and that's very high cost. Um, but it's nutritionally very dense. Mm -hmm. And so we know that this will become commoditized. And what that entails is a lot of policy shifts and a lot of capital shifts to be able to create a product that um, is accessible to people. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's not really accessible because it's niche mm -hmm. and novelty. Mm -hmm. But we know that um, it's a necessity. Mm -hmm. They predict by 2050, we'll be eating about 100 million metric tons of insect protein. That's only 30 years away. You know? So we know by working with the youth <laughs> that immediately, these are the people that are going to be eating this. Yeah. These are the people that are going to be working with this. Yeah. And this is just one small piece. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Anthony, I'm ready to join your uh, food tour. You're in? Too. I know. <laughs> yeah, we're, Oaxaca will shop the Chapulines market. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this is um, not new. Yeah, yeah. It's not um, new. Can I um, can I pick up on your question on like is is small business really going to drive employment? And I think um, I think the short answer is yes, but with some caveats. So. One is that we already see small business driving employment for, um, for inner city residents in particular. If we think about Detroit in particular, you have a, lot, a large number of the unemployed population with really high barriers to unemployment. Low literacy rates, returning citizens. If you factor in that major employers might require a credit check, um, you're talking about a, a lot of mm -hmm. barriers to entry for which um, small businesses we hypothesize part of the reason why they're over-indexing on these hires is because they're, they might be more forgiving on some of these things. Mm -hmm. We also know that, um, that Detroit in Detroit, there's a lack of entry-level jobs. Again, like mm -hmm. the, the kinds of jobs that are going to get people 
on the path. We want to put them on career pathways. We want to get them to the place where they're doing middle skill jobs. But in fact, a lot of Detroiters need that early and um, job entry. And they're having to travel to the suburbs to get them right now. And so I think a big part of the economic development strategy for Detroit, which I think it was, um, you know, our our company has been there for um, for a long time. And as a native Midwesterner, I'd personally been to Detroit. But the first time I showed up in my J.P. Morgan um, capacity, I think this is one of the first things that Tom Luan said to me was, yeah. you know, if, if we could get our black owned businesses in the city to hire one or two people, mm -hmm. we would solve unemployment in this city. Now, of course, it's not that easy, uh, of course, but it does give you a sense of, you know, this is a solvable problem. Mm -hmm but it, it's going to require the kinds of supports that, um, that, are, that have been described on the panel to get businesses who right now employ two people to the place where they're going to employ four people. I mean, that's a 100% increase in employment. That's significant, and it doesn't happen uh, by accident. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. No, I was just, I was sitting here thinking, and I don't know if this is even in line with the question, but... Um, in terms of skills and, yeah. and readiness, uh, it's kind of a now or later, remember that candy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now or later proposition because yeah. there's so many needs of now yeah. because you're dealing with a population mm -hmm. um, that uh, education attainment is not that high. But at the same time, some of the things that we've been thinking about is how can you use you know, this whole culture change around seeing entrepreneurship as a potential path? Mm -hmm. um, and not only that everybody's going to be, every kid should be an entrepreneur, but that your city is a place that supports you, where there's opportunity for people that look like you. Um, and so the role of how we put those images in front of the young people matter. Mm -hmm. um, what stories we tell, how we promote what's going on, and show the diverse faces of the people participating in that. Um, and then also uh, what we start to see, I think the beauty of, of Detroit is that there's so many great needs that we're drawing and attracting and even retaining so many young people that are not creating businesses just to benefit them yeah. and their bottom line, but businesses that are intended to benefit the society they're a part of. And even in that, you see, you know, the more we can lift those up, the more you can also show the young people that these are things that you can also do. And a lot of those entrepreneurs are including young people in that process. Um, so I don't know if that, you know, no, I was think, applicable, yeah. but that's where no, my that's head was at. <laughs> I think that's really relevant. We've seen a lot of that too in our community. That, that, talking to to students in a way that's very relevant about these roles has been a big initiative of a couple different groups. The other thing I was thinking about too is a system, um, a system, which is it's hard for a small business that needs to hire one or two people to find one, you know, five or ten people to fill that job. And the system that can take those 40 growing small businesses and try to make it more efficient to find the hundred people who are good applicants for that, that's a that's a barrier today that we're trying, you know, we yeah. want to work through because I think that's what will fill the jobs at some kind of scale in addition to creating them. So we're about to open it up for questions. Um, so I hope you have um, some in, in your mind. Um, and before we do that, I'll just take a very brief kind of stroll down the panel. If you guys can just share one kind of pithy, in this world of tweets, one pithy takeaway that you hope people would observe um, from, from today's discussion. Like for me, it's um, that it's tempting to think about, you know, just regular um, business incentive programs like taxes when you think about growing business in a city, but rather like the role that neighborhood and community development plays in terms of giving workers places to live and also customers with spending power. But I, I'd love to hear that and then we'll go to questions. Just one. <laughs> um, I would say um, the big thing is how are we looking to, you know, create new markets by looking at necessity. I think necessity is what is driving invention. Mm -hmm. And in that necessity of people, where do we find this commonplace where we can make the world better together? Mm -hmm. um, I think that has to come in the forefront of any business development because we have enough going on in the world right now that we don't need anything superfluous. You know, We need to be able to create opportunities for people that have intrinsic value. Um, doing this work in a way that is truly inclusive 
it um, creates different work. And I think that is the most, it's the economic imperative that we do this work in a way that is truly inclusive and allows everybody to be able to participate. And I would add, uh, startups and bin-ups are the key to inclusive economic development. Yeah, building on both of, on all of that, for me, it's the um, it's the both and that your um, that your city is going to need your high growth and your neighborhood based businesses. It needs big businesses and small businesses. All of these things work together, uh, you know, and through supply chains, through sharing of customers, by creating vibrant places where highly talented people want to live, where uh, low and moderate income people can get the services they need. And we should not think of this space or its solutions monolithically. Thank you. So, wow. Oh. Yeah, this is <laughs> exciting. Um, let's start um, Start in the back. Blue shirt. Uh, my name's Kirk Renault. I, I grew up in Detroit. And in that neighborhood that Janice mentioned, the villages. And I, <clears throat> I want you to think about a young family in that neighborhood. Um, Maybe you've got kids, and maybe you have a job at the vegan soul food restaurant now mm -hmm. in Agnes. And uh, <clears throat> but last week there was a drive-by shooting in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> there are, the schools are not so great. So I'm thinking, well, it's not capital. I've got a job there, maybe, but I have to decide for my family: do I move to the suburbs and feel more secure, mm -hmm. uh, where the school choices are better? So. Mm -hmm. Don't we have to address security and, and education oh, opportunities absolutely. to keep people in the city with, with the jobs we're creating now? Absolutely. I mean, all of those factors are, it's one big complex thing. Um, education, you know, the role that education plays, the educational system plays uh, matters in terms of we can attract talent, but how would you retain them? How do you continue to develop young people that are productive and that will stick around? Um, and go on to college, um, huge factor. Uh, safety, it's all a factor. I think the advantage that we have today that we probably didn't have you know, a decade ago is um, city leadership that really is taking on those challenges in a very bold way. Uh, the work that the mayor has done to address blight, um, to getting street lights turned on, et cetera. And then of course, uh, we just named the new superintendent of schools. Um, who has his work cut out for them. And I think none of us, you know, it's, it's funny doing this work because you always do this work with all of that in mind. Because you know that, you know, we have this one thread that we're knitting, you know, together. Um, but it really is relying upon all these other threads coming together. Uh, but you do see, you know, a strong mayoral leadership, philanthropy coming out in all types of ways, not just around economic development, around education, around placemaking, around um, all of those types of issues. It's, it's a big complex issue, yeah. And so you're exactly right. And they all rely on each other. Yep. Over here. Um, yeah, I grew up in Hamtramck, moved oh. away a long time ago, so I'm glad you're doing things there. Um, and I also went to University of Michigan, so, you know, you do have good universities, Wayne State and, and Michigan, and so how are these universities playing into what you do? Yeah, um, me in particular, they've been an invaluable resource. We are looking at a few different institutional partnerships for research, for some downstream applications of our product, for instance, they come in with a totally different set of values and structures that is, I think, really um, approachable to young folks starting a business. Um, it's not enough, definitely not enough. Um, I exist in a space that seems um, kind of uh, people don't want to believe it, and so <laughs> it makes it difficult to kind of bridge a gap where I can actually have a real conversation with people. Um, but beyond that, I think they have to play a much bigger role, you know, the universities, in the sense of how are we fostering talent, how are we taking students and creating opportunities, because I, I dreamt up this mm -hmm. opportunity. <laughs> like, my background, um, you know, was not directly pointing this way mm -hmm. when I started school. And so 
I know that the universities can take on a very more, I think, a much more in-depth role. And how are we like bridging these gaps? Because there are resources. There's funding. There's, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's data, mm -hmm. and there's also students. And so that's something that mm -hmm. we can do. But I know that's not, you know, necessarily as relevant to a Ben up like uh, mm -hmm. what Pam was saying. Are there bridges between your programs and, and universities that exist today? Um, so uh, I'll, I'll mention two. Um, Pam can probably speak to um, many more. Um, but I think one of the most powerful examples in the city, at least in the space where I work, is Tech Town and Wayne State. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, Tech Town really started as a way to commercialize technology coming out of Wayne State. And, um, and Ned Stabler and the leadership team there really recognized, I think, similar to how you were describing it, Kathy, that, wait, there's all this entrepreneurial activity happening out in communities, out in neighborhoods. By the way, the entrepreneurs coming in my door don't reflect the diversity of the city. How do we get out there in a different way? So a place like Tech Town, with its name, Tech Town, and being connected <laughs> to a university is now... Um, has a retail boot camp, mm -hmm. which um, mm -hmm. I've neglected to mention the Entrepreneurs of Color Fund that um, uh, develop, um, Detroit Development Fund uh, runs and uh, we support in, in partnership with W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Um, several of the largely retail businesses, 39 out of 44 based in the neighborhoods, many of them going through the retail boot camps at a place like Tech Town. And that's a unique partnership with, um, with that university. We're also working with um, the University of Michigan Law School um, to create to um, bring law students who are providing pro bono legal advice to business startups. Um, there's probably plenty more that is yeah. happening, but those are two that we're working with. Yeah, there's a couple of different plays. Um, University of Michigan now more so on the technology commercialization side and the support of startups, but uh, the Michigan Life Science um, Incubator in Western mm -hmm. Wayne County is a part of the University of Michigan, and that's been helping to really advance a lot of uh, biomedical and, and life science type entrepreneurs, but doing that in a way that is um, important not just to Ann Arbor, but them having connections with the incubators and accelerators and the early stage seed funds in Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, Wayne State, you mentioned mm -hmm. Tech Town, but they also have the Launchstone Black uh, Blackstone Launchpad program mm -hmm. where there's an entrepreneurial program for students. Mm -hmm. uh, they also do a, um, a collaboration with the Launchpad program, Tech Town, and other service providers where students are going through a boot camp in the mm -hmm. summer. Um, and, and then you have Michigan State, who I can't leave out because they're my alma mater. <laughs> um, you know, the work that they're doing to support Eastern Market and Food Lab as they're supporting food entrepreneurs. And so all of them are very interested. U of M and Michigan State are also very interested yeah. in what happens in the city of Detroit. And you see them showing up in a big way um, and working very closely together. Fix a village. Lots of Fix parallel paths. Yeah. Um, Let's take one from social media. Curious who's on the line. Um, in a similar vein um, to the question that was just asked, um, Mary Rocco said that um, you had some great examples of private and um, nonprofit support for small businesses, and she wanted to know what is the role and capacity of the public sector. Let's take one Cleveland. Sure. So I had mentioned uh, in Cleveland that the public sector had been an important partner, and I think there's there's many many ways that they have been an important partner. Um, with some of the issues we were just talking about, for example, security and school systems and knowing that those things were incredibly important to the emerging and burgeoning entrepreneurial ecosystem as well. Um, but other ways that they've been involved is to work with organizations in Cleveland to help us do some placemaking so that small businesses um, have the spaces that they can move into, but there's also a culture and a vibrancy that's created around key commercial corridors. And in doing that, it's really visible. You know, it's the, the growth of the businesses, the uh, growth of an entrepreneurial culture becomes more visible and it becomes more attainable for people who are living in the neighborhoods around that. And the city planning group and the city uh, leadership and the county planning group and leadership uh, in our community have been really helpful in anchoring those places. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's get to more questions. Um, oh, oh, go ahead. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Rob, for your wonderful presentation and support. Thank you, all of you. My name is Rosemary Segero. I'm a president of a company called Segero International Group. I'm based here in Washington, D.C., and we focus on innovation and manufacturing, especially here in the U.S., but uh, the other focus is in Africa on agriculture. I focus more of the rural area agriculture. How do we learn from international uh, people what we are doing here in the U.S. state to state and internationally? I'll be going to Saudi Arabia to look at how small and medium businesses, we can learn from each other and other mm -hmm. Middle East countries. We, if we learn from each other, instead of Africans running to come to America um, because they are looking for jobs, they can still work there. And other countries can still work in their countries. And the Americans, they make America great again in their own countries. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we come together and come up with this uh, international global is SMEs. I think this would be a very good learning, uh, you know, uh, learning from each other, entrepreneurs, SMEs, and uh, how do we, how do you support us? Start up on the, the actual SMEs. How do we do this? Thank you so much, and I appreciate your session. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to take a quick shot at that. So Small Business Forward is a global program, and we have strong anchors in uh, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, um, and uh, UK, we're moving into Europe and have a, probably do a small amount of grant making in, in Asia as well. And, um, and I, you know, I think the thing about having this bird's eye view is you see very universal themes with, um, with contexts and cultures that vary. So the same sorts of things that we're talking about here in terms of what entrepreneurs need to thrive and kind of the naughtiness of the, of the issues, you know, that we have to untangle are the very same challenges that we see entrepreneurs facing in South Africa, in the UK. So I think your point is a really good one in terms of where are the international platforms in which we can trade good ideas mm -hmm. and we can, as Kathy brought up in, in her um, initial remarks, really learn from the various models that are out there. I think there's a few of these um, platforms out there. It's certainly a place where I'd love to see our work grow. Um, this uh, summer, there's a major conference in Paris. Unfortunately, I'm not going. A colleague, <laughs> several of my colleagues will go. Um, but where we are going to start exploring how we're creating more uh, ex sort of exchange across the globe. I think it's an area that's really ripe, given that there, there are these really common challenges, but everybody's coming up with sort of unique and innovative uh, interventions. Um, so, um, wait. There, with the with the green T-shirt. Oh. You've been waiting. You've been waiting. <laughs> right, there's a lot of hands in front of me. Um, thanks very much for this panel. My name is Claire. I work in consulting here in DC. Grew up in Corktown. Um, my question is to um, how to encourage this this wealth of capital into parts of the city that haven't quite um, come so far as as what Corktown's done in the last ten years. Um, really getting capital where it's needed. I know we talked to it a little bit on the panel, but a little more detail would be mm -hmm. great. Yeah, so, so how, do, how do you very intentionally kind of work on that specifically, Karen? So I think there's a couple of initiatives in addition to NEI, and you guys can help me here a little bit too. Um, yeah. You know, with our work, how we've invested in uh, programs that are right in the neighborhood matter, uh, the amount of capital we've been putting into our small businesses challenges are going right into the neighborhood. The mayor is also uh, has his own... Um, programs where he is helping uh, with federal dollars and philanthropic dollars, activating spaces for entrepreneurs in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Detroit uh, Strategic Fund mm -hmm. um, that is really uh, hitting on, right now, I think they're starting with three or four mm -hmm. very specific neighborhoods that have some level of momentum but a lot of promise where there's a lot of doubling down in terms of investment um, not just around entrepreneurship, but around the place, uh, around activating um, that community mm -hmm. in a very holistic way. Yeah, if um, I could, yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I Please didn't need to go cut ahead you off, if though. you know more about um, that. Well, I just I wanted to jump in on a, uh, a couple of points. So one thing that I think um, Detroit has done very well um, with seeds planted under Rip's leadership, um, the philanthropy in the city, but really with um, Mayor Duggan picking up the torch is identifying these uh, neighborhoods where 
we're really going to concentrate activity. Mm -hmm. You're hearing uh, about a ton of good stuff that's happening in Detroit, but it's a big place with a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. And so by getting specific on where neighborhoods are going and to the gentleman's question earlier, really concentrating city resources, philanthropy resources, the intellectual capital, um, to, as starting places to then build out and create anchor communities has been incredibly important. So um, the Strategic Neighborhood Fund starting in three places, the eight hardest hit neighborhoods where um, the land bank really went after the blight problem, uh, this, this is all really helpful. The, um, so then on top of this, one thing that, and I would say a number of the programs really are focused on getting businesses out into the neighborhoods and they've been mentioned. Entrepreneurs of Color Fund, um, when we worked with W.K. Kellogg and Detroit Development Fund to put that up, it was really a focus on businesses that were out in neighborhoods that were not getting access to mm -hmm. capital. And um, one of the examples maybe the gentleman mentioned, um, Vegan Soul um, in West Village is now opening in Grandmont, Rosedale. Yep. It will be that neighborhood's first sit-down restaurant. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing else like it in, in that neighborhood, and they're able to move to that place, and again, all the follow-on yeah. positive effects. Um, so that's just one tiny example, but I think the combination of you've got a set of service providers that are focused on neighborhoods, and then you've got city leadership to say, let's bring all those resources together in place, be very specific and strategic about it, has been um, incredibly helpful for Detroit. Yeah, the microloan space has been interesting because the Entrepreneur of Color Fund, as well as the um, Detroit Development Fund and Michigan mm -hmm. Women's Foundations yep. work in microlending, and we're just launching a new fund, um, thanks to Capital Impact and um, Fisher Foundation in a, in a little bit. But they've moved about three or more million dollars to yep. 64 or so companies, none of which are within that greater downtown footprint. Mm -hmm. They're all within the other zip codes of the city. And, um, and, and you also have the social entrepreneurs that are, there's an interesting uh, collaboration with a digital literacy uh, mm -hmm. group called Allied Media Projects and Rocket Fiber, one of our new startups that brought gigabit fiber into the community, where they're actually uh, putting gigabit fiber in three neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have the work of philanthropy, you have the work of the yeah. state, and you also have the work of social innovators that are doing these interesting, um, innovative projects together to move resources into the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So we have one, time for one final question. Um, kind of we'll go with you. I was curious, how do an organization like Kresge and, and JP Morgan, kind of older and newer funders, but also coming from a different mindset, how do you work together, and where are you different? Hmm. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm happy to, to start. Um, as I mentioned, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase has an 80-year history in the city of Detroit. So um, while I might have had some newness, my, my firm didn't. Um, but when, you know, this uh, uh, Jamie Dimon, our chairman and CEO, likes to tell the story frequently of know, kind of his talk with, um, with folks who are really describing um, where Detroit was and saying, hey, you are the biggest bank in this city, do something. And Jamie turning mm -hmm. around to the rest of us saying, we're the biggest bank in the city, why don't we do something? And we're like, okay. So, you know, a bunch of us set off on a, on a fact-finding tour. And what was amazing about a place, um, about where Detroit was in this moment, so this was late 2013, still in the throes of bankruptcy, but the, um, the amount of collaboration that existed in the city and the amount of table setting that had already been done by Twesky, Kellogg, Skillman, let me not list them all because I will leave somebody out, <laughs> but it was really incredible and really the leadership role of Kresge can't be understated. So that as we came to town and said, hey, we want to help, there was this table that was already set that said, mm. great, here's a plan, we're, here's what we're working on. And we said, here's the few things we think we're really good at. And they said, great, mm -hmm. here, here it is, here's what we're all working on. And so it gave us uh, a way to, um, to invest in, uh, a, in a way that aligned already with our strategic priority areas in places where we could bring time and talent to the table, not just our dollars, um, but, but plug into a broader whole. 
that's mm -hmm. been the really exciting thing about partnering with Kresge in um, in Detroit. And now it's it's sort of it's a really high bar because what everybody asks us, what's the next Detroit? Where are you going to put your next hundred million? We're like, wow. I mean, the um, both the depth of the problem, but also the the um, level of coordination mm -hmm. that was happening in the city um, really doesn't exist in a lot of places. And so it's made for really those, um, the seeds of recovery had been laid and I think allowed us to plug in in a really unique way. There's just such a series of things and actions that need to be supported and taken and we each do different things. Um, uh, we each have different strengths when it comes to what our sectors can do, what our capital can do, what kind of table setting we can do. And I think it's been about creating kind of a, a web of figuring out who plugs in where and how do we cover mm -hmm. all of the things that need to be done in the city um, based on our, our areas of expertise. And it's, it's needy work. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. that's right. So I just can't thank you enough for being here, for listening, for being interested in Detroit and also how we drive small business forward in our other legacy cities. So thank you very much. And thanks to this panel who makes it a very easy. Yeah.